I'm pleased to be here. I love presenting to fitness professionals. It's one of my favorite groups. It's actually the only group I like to present to, so I kind of stick to that. My, um, my experience is as a registered dietitian, but my doctorate's in exercise physiology. And actually, probably some of you know Len Kravitz. He's kind of a, a well-known dude among the exercise physiology world, and he was my advisor. So anyway, I'm pleased to be here. Does anybody think that that microphone is actually on, or do you think you can just hear me because of the volume I'm speaking? Might be on a little. Might be on a little bit? Okay, so maybe they'll turn it up a little bit. I'm getting over a cold, so I don't want to speak too loudly because then I'll start coughing and, oh my God, that's not any fun at all. So I'm excited to speak today about pre-workout nutrition, but not so much looking at, um, you've already, you may have already been to a session before on pre-workout, what are the exact foods to be eating. So today we're going to focus a little bit on energy. And so we're going to talk about energy and partly because it's actually one of the hottest topics among consumers. So if you start taking a look around at different stores or even talking to some of your, your clients or most of your clients, everybody wants energy. They want energy, energy, energy. So we use that term all, the, all of the time. And I know that maybe you're like me where you're secretly thinking, well, you should sleep more. But um, regardless, people are looking for energy. And so when you speak to your athletes, and when you speak to people that are in the, in the fitness world and active folks and clients, um, it's good to get them back on track on what energy means to them as far as their workout goes, their sport. And so all of this that we'll talk about today is really more application. So we're not going to take a painful dive into the science. I want to talk about things that you can then relate to your clients or relate to the athletes that you work with to get them back on track so that they understand what energy really means. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, the different nutrients that contain energy. And sorry I have to hold this, but I did have no, no clips on me whatsoever. Um, so we'll talk about the class of nutrients that provide energy. That will be probably a reminder for most of you. Um, we'll give a definition. What's the factual definition of energy? What actually, what is energy other than um, what they're using now in commercials, you know, to get you through your day and to get, get through that, you know, 3 p.m. slump. Um, what influences energy needs during exercise? So what are the factors? Um, what's not considered energy also? That's, that's important. And then the value of pre-energy exercise or energy, pre-exercise energy sources. So we'll talk a little bit about carbohydrate. We'll talk about caffeine because it's got some interesting um, data that it's shown to have some value before exercise. We'll talk about protein and then we'll finish up with how to, how to give your, your athletes the guidance they need for energy, actually calculating the energy as far as calories that they require. All right, so uh, what, what is energy? So we know that to a consumer, it can mean you know, feeling tired. Um, it start, start watching things now. You'll see that it's, we associate it with, with fatigue. So um, when we've started to associate snacks with preventing that fatigue, so now we're really confusing what the word energy means. Um, it also can mean enthusiasm for doing different tasks. And I always think about this one because I think that people have low energy sometimes because of, you know, it's not that you have low energy, it's that your job sucks. Because if you were like to pull out something, they're like, oh, three o'clock, I'm just like totally out of energy. And if you said to them, do you want to go do your favorite thing? They're like, totally, and they have plenty of energy. So the enthusiasm for doing tasks is the way that your clients or athletes are going to consider energy. And then it's calories in food. So it's, there's a nutritional component too that provide fuel to muscles in the brain. And that's more aligned with what it actually is. So what are the governmental um, agencies, the FDA for example, what do they say about what energy actually is? Um, they say that the first two categories, it's you know, subjective, feeling tired. That's really difficult to quantify. And enthusiasm for doing tasks is also very challenging to figure out what exactly that means. Um, so we quantify energy as it relates to food. So it's easier to, to frame a definition around energy as it comes from food. Um, it's, it refers to the food's ability to fuel physical activity. So that doesn't even have to be exercise, just activity in general. Um, enhancing mental function, so having your brain work um, the way that you want it to. And also sustaining physical per performance. And that part is, is probably a you think is most important to the folks you're working with. But as you know, um, mental function is just as important, especially for sport. 
practical question for your client. So this is where you want to steer your clients. Oh, we're getting a little bit louder. Um, how do we deliver energy to the body from food? And what's the right kind of energy? And then how can we make the energy last longer? So those are the, those are the questions that, you're at, that your clients and your athletes should be seeking answers to. So how do we deliver it? What is the best food sources? Or what are the, the nutrients that we should be looking for when we have energy in our mind? And then how can we make it last longer so you can sustain your workout? So major classes of nutrients. This is something that you all took in your introductory to nutrition class because I used to be a professor at Ohio State, so I know that you took that class. Um, we know that water, carbs, fat, protein, vitamins, and minerals, those are our six classes of nutrients. But we know that the macronutrients, carbs, fats, lipids, and protein are those that, um, that actually supply us with energy. And we know that vitamins and minerals help to facilitate the use of energy, but they don't give us energy. So uh, you know, reminding your, your clients that when they buy their vitamin and mineral supplement and it's for energy, they didn't just buy it for energy. Um, you can measure the heat release from food and combust it in a laboratory, and that's where we get an energy um, definition. We know it in calories, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, by measuring this heat release, it's called calorimetry. And we know that alcohol supplies energy, and, um, but it's really not considered one of the main nutrients, except for in Vegas. I think it's a little bit different. I think it totally is. We'll have, a, we'll have someone with cocktails coming through the, in another half hour. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so dietary car carbohydrates. These provide energy, as we know. And I wanted to give, you know, just get everybody up to the, on the same page. So sugars, we have monosaccharides, disaccharides. This will become important when we talk about the, the chain, or the branching of the chains when we look at something like a glycemic index. Um, Starches, the polymer chain of many glucose units. Okay, that's all the starches. And then dietary fibers, which are extremely important for health. Um, they're fermentable and non-fermentable. They're important for health, but they're not readily digested. So they do con contribute to our carb intake, but we know that, that fiber isn't something that we readily digest. And that's where the benefits come from. Um, whether it be a soluble fiber of this skiss fiber, like an oatmeal that helps to reduce cholesterol levels or improve satiety. Um, to some of the, the plant, um, like the green leafy, or even the, the citrus fruits that contain fiber. They're non-soluble. All right, so glycogen. That's our stored form of carbohydrate, as we know. Those are the glucose polymers in muscle. And about an 80 kilogram man is going to store about 500 um, grams of carbohydrates in the body. And that's going to increase, as you know, with exercise. And that's an important point to make to your athletes. And, when they start getting turned on by some of the low carb diets. Now, saying low carb diet is not trendy now, okay? That's not the current fad diet. Does anybody know what the current carbohydrate related fad diet is? The biggest one right now? Yep. You're gonna see it all over the place now. It's the wheat belly. So we've taken the low carb diet, which is looking at um, taking out carbohydrates across the board, you know, research didn't support it. People weren't really hanging in with it. They didn't really like it. It kind of went out of fashion. It wasn't cool anymore. But now we really care about getting wheat out of the diet. Same thing, right? We're still trying to, people are still um, looking to remove carbohydrates. People love to remove entire categories of foods from their diets. And I'm sure you've been dealing with this with some of your athletes where they say they want to go gluten free, they want to go wheat free, and you're worried about how they're going to get energy for their activity because you know that carbohydrate is how we replenish our glycogen stores, which is what we use during exercise. And so you end up having long conversations with your athletes about this, I'm sure. Um, but this will help to remind them, glycogen is their stored form of carbohydrate. It's what fuels the muscle. Um, it can be modified with diet as well as exercise. You actually will store more glycogen, as I men mentioned, the more trained you are. It's kind of like if you consider a carb-loading diet. So carb loading prior to exercise, what's the most important part of that? To keep exercising a little bit while you're carb loading because the whole stimulus for saving that carbohydrate is to be exercising during it. And that makes sense, right? Because otherwise, um, you could, people could be sitting on their couch and just loading up on carbohydrates and not getting fat and just increasing their glycogen stores. But we know that the body doesn't work like that, unfortunately, right? All right, dietary lipids. Um, we know that triglycerides provide energy. It's a glycerol and fatty acids 
Um, we have saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats. Two of them are essential. We know that the essential fats are linoleic and linolenic acid. Those are the two that can't be made by the body, so we have to consume them. So fat is going to provide us with energy. The interesting part, or maybe the confusing part about fat, even for your athletes, is that there's different ways of categorizing fat that won't affect whether or not you use fat for energy. So saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fat, you're going to use that for energy in the same way. The difference is that the saturation may increase the risk for other issues. So saturated fat has been linked to high cholesterol levels, has been linked to cardio, cardiovascular disease. So we know that there are issues associated with saturated fat, even with some cancers. We know that monounsaturated is inert. So it doesn't really do anything, um, which is interesting because olive oil has a ton of attention, right? It's supposed to be like the most heart healthy oil that you can get. Actually, olive oil is the best marketing that you can get because olive oil is really high in monounsaturated fat, which, which kind of helps you break even. It's low in saturated, high in mono, and so you just kind of break even. It's the polyunsaturated fat that's going to give you heart health benefits, and that's something that olive oil is very low in. Um, but olive oil has done a much better job than, say, canola oil in telling the consumers about um, the types of fat that it contains and what types of fat you, that you should be looking for. But when it comes to your athletes, any of those fats will provide energy. But as we all know, you don't speak in terms of sport only. You want to make sure that they're also you know, considering longevity and health. And so you want to move them more towards the mono and the polyunsaturated fats. Polys are going to be in your nuts. They're, it's going to be in your plant-based oils. Um, and then also in fish as well. So we won't go into too much detail about that as far as like the different food sources, but just know that the good fats, so to speak, are going to be your plant-based fish, nuts, seeds, things like that. Um, main fatty acids in diets are typically 12 carbon atoms or longer. Medium chain are, are going to have um, 8 to 10 carbon. For protein, um, and I'm going to turn this off when I have to cough. That's uh, to save your ears, so I don't cough into a microphone, you know? Um, all right, so protein. We know that protein provides energy. Um, protein is pretty phenomenal, right? I mean, it's, um, it's one of the most interesting macronutrients, I think, mainly because, and um, certainly your next presenter you know, is the, the master of, of all that is protein. But I always found it extremely interesting because it's the only, it's one of those nutrients that we actually recycle in the body. So we take in whole protein and we like, you can, you break down the amino acids and you use them to make other proteins in the body and you recycle the protein. So even when you, when you use enzymes to actually digest and um, produce energy and metabolism, you have an enzyme that's then broken down to amino acids. So there's this like constant recycling that's going on. It's the best recycling program out there. And it makes protein, it shows just how important protein is. But also of interest is, it means that we don't actually have to eat as much of it as the other foods. So we'll talk a little bit about intake and, and how much that actually translates to. But I think that's um, a good thing for your athletes to keep in mind too. Um, having adequate protein in the diet is essential, especially if you're active. But don't forget that it does, we don't have to have, we actually are able to recycle the amino acids that we use. So we don't need an astronomical amount of protein. And thank goodness, right, because it would have, cavemen would have died off and you know, things would have been really difficult because protein deficiencies and having low protein diets can be pretty common um, in deprived areas. All right, so we have nine essential amino acids for human health. Um, some of them become conditionally essential, such as glutamine, um, if the body is under stress or, or in disease states. So does the body use protein for energy? It, it totally can, right? But we know that protein has so many valuable jobs um, from hormone, creating hormones to enzymes to muscle synthesis um, that we actually don't want it to be used for energy. We want to, be, we want to make sure that we're using um, carbohydrates and fats for energy and not wasting protein on energy. Um, maybe 5 to 10% of the total cost of exercise uses protein as, their, as the substrate, as the fuel source. So it's not something that we typically use during activity, um, except for the branch chain amino acids, because really, we, there, there's other jobs. Um, someone else has that job, the carbs and the fat do. Um, if you are depleted in carbohydrates, it is going to increase your amino acid oxidation. And so 
which is great because the body has a way to protect you. So you're not just going to like keel over if you run out of carbs, but rather you have a, a backup plan. Um, but it's not awesome if you're trying to preserve your muscle mass because we really don't want to be searching for amino acids um, in the body when we're exercising and increasing amino acid oxidation to the point where we could um, affect our, our muscle mass. All right, and it's a little bit more, it's more trouble to use protein for energy um, because we have to remove the nitrogen group and have to excrete it in, as urea um, before metabolizing the, the carbon skeleton. All right, vitamins, they don't provide energy. Um, doesn't matter what the supplement container says. Oh, and what's interesting too is that the word energy is not regulated. So, you know, there's certain words that you're allowed to use on a label um, and in marketing, whether it be through the FTC or the FDA, and the word energy doesn't really have a, a distinct de definition. So you can say that something gives you energy. It's just like if you look at food products and they say it's important or it's smart, like those don't have definitions, so they can use them. Um, but you can't use the word healthy. So you won't see healthy on anything because there's actually a definition to use the word healthy. But there isn't for energy. So anything can advertise that it has energy, that it is going to give you energy, make you feel great, you know, last longer. Those are things that aren't regulated by the FTC or FDA. So they can, they can be used to describe a product. If we um, have questions, do you want us to wait until the end? You know, yeah, that? he asked if we should wait till the end if there's a question. It would be best only because they're videotaping and sometimes um, you know, when someone asks a question and then you watch the video and you're like, I can't hear anything during this part of the video. So I will, I've been, I will break right at 10 till so that there'll be time. So thanks though. Um, all right. So we have our water soluble and our fat soluble vitamins. We measure energy through calories and this is a, this is a rerun for many of you. One calorie, it's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. Um, Nutritional calories is equivalent to 1,000 scientific or energy calories, and that's where they have the difference in the, the small C and the capital C. So when we say that a slice of bread has 70 calories, we're really saying that it means 70 kilocalories or 70 um, nutritional calories. Any energy, con uh, energy constants for macronutrients, this is something you might want to speak with your athletes about. It depends on if you have an athlete that really wants the numbers. Um, and wants to calculate the amount that they're getting from, from the foods that they eat. We know that carbohydrates supply us about four calories per gram. Um, protein, four calories per gram in general. Fat, these are all rough estimates, although they always just round them off to a single digit. Um, nine calories. Me the medium chain is a little bit lower. And then alcohol or ethanol is going to be seven calories per gram. So how do we go from the food that we eat to powering muscles? So talking to your athletes, I was thinking about this section and how to, how, what would be most valuable for you to speak with your athletes about? Well, digestion of food. So starting with the digestion of food, explaining to them, not the details of it because very few people are interested in that. So you digest the food that you eat, you break it down into the, the lowest common denominators. And then it's absorbed in the, the nutrients from the lowest common denominator is absorbed in the intestine, from the intestine into the bloodstream. This uptake of nutrients from the blood then is taken to the muscle cells. And I urge you to keep it that simple because this, it's, it is that simple actually. And I, actually, I find this, the description to be helpful for those especially that say, I understand I have to combine certain foods because otherwise it will block the digestion. And you say, well, well, no, it doesn't. Because everybody has, everything in the body has its own, own job. So what breaks down and digests protein and facilitates the absorption is only for protein. And then whatever is digesting the enzymes and the necessary elements to digest carbohydrates are only doing carbohydrates. And the same goes for fat. So digestion and absorption can be viewed this simple. And I know that, you know, some of these diets have, perpetuated, they've continued where they talk about, you know, different foods. You have to eat an apple before you eat this and certain times of day and that makes a difference for digestion. And I tell people to, oh my gosh, if it was that complex, we would like have been wiped out years ago. I mean, we never would have lasted if it was that challenging to digest food. So I think that's the easiest way to look at it. 
Um, we know that nutrients are then used to um, provide energy through adenosine triphosphate. Um, and this is, um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I see these images and I get nightmares, just like shivers down my spine seeing the structures. But adenosine triphosphate um, is our energy currency, basically, of our cells. Um, the creatine phosphate pathway is something, is what is used for our quick energy. It's like, it's 18 seconds, so it's our, our very powerful, short, high intensity energy source. We don't have a lot of creatine stores, so it's a limiting factor um, for adenosine triphosphate during explosive or high intensity exercises such as weightlifting or sprinting. So creatine is a limiting factor, and it plays a role in this maximal effort. So exercise we do at maximal effort. This is 10 seconds, but it's like anywhere from 10 to 18 seconds. Um, so key dietary recommendations or issues is to maintain and maximize these creatine stores. And we do that through the, the foods that we consume. You know that something like even like hamburger or beef is going to have creatine. And then sometimes people use it, you know, use supplementation. All right, so how do you decide what to burn? How does the body decide what to burn? And, you know, we use the word burn because substrate utilization is just not going to resonate with your athletes and clients. So um, deciding what to burn or what to use as the fuel source. And it can be confusing to people because what we use as the fuel source isn't necessarily aligned with, like, intuitively with what our goals are. So if we say, I want to lose fat, it doesn't necessarily mean that the substrate you want to use is fat. So when you say you want to lose body fat, if we use burn as it relates to metabolism, it doesn't mean you necessarily want to burn fat as the fuel source, right? Because you would actually get more bang for your buck if you were burning carbohydrate and increasing the amount of oxygen that you consume so that you're actually burning more calories over time, which will then lead to burning or losing body fat. So I think this is a concept that continues to be challenging for athletes to relate to and definitely for lay populations. You know, I have to stay at a low intensity because that way I burn fat so that I can lose body fat. That's not actually going to work out very well, is it? All right, so we know it is influenced by a number of factors, the intensity of the exercise, the amount of oxygen that's available to us. And the oxygen availability is going to be dependent on um, your environment, but also your fitness level, if you're able, you know, your respiratory um, response to exercise. Fuel source is available, so if you're carbohydrate depleted, you have no, low levels of carbohydrate, that's going to affect the kind of fuel that you use. As you know, it will also affect the kind of intensity that you can exercise at even if you have an amazing mind over matter. Um, hormonal influences. So insulin is going to blunt the use of um, fatty acids during exercise, and epinephrine, cortisol, the stress hormones, or the fight or flight with epinephrine, that's going to influence what we use for fuel. So blood sugar or blood glucose is going to be used more readily with epinephrine um, with our stress hormones being present. And that makes sense because if we're running away from a dinosaur and our stress hormones increase and our muscles are flooded with the increase in availability of blood, blood glucose, that's going to help us get the hell out of the way. So it, it makes sense that, it, that that would happen. Training effects are going to affect our ability to, if the more trained we are, we're going to be better at delivering and using oxygen as well as the substrates, um, substrate <coughs> utilization or using fatty acids or using carbohydrate. Muscle fiber makeup, so thinking back to slow and fast twitch muscle fiber types, those that are, will dominate, what may affect, will affect the kind of um, fuel source that you have. So if we look at exercise intensity with substrate oxidation in trained men, um, and I think this is, these are the graphs I find kind of exciting when someone's just getting involved in exercise or starting to, um, really master their sport is looking at how their training is actually making them more, um, making them better at metabolism. Like, I mean, it's a simplification of like what's actually happening, but to uh, the idea that you could get better at metabolism. So as we increase, um, when we look at the VO2 max or the intensity as our, our measure of intensity, when we're at a low intensity, 25% VO2 max, we're going to use our plasma free fatty acids they're available in the bloodstream. And then we're also going to be using um, a little bit of plasma glucose and some muscle triglycerides. Um, but it's mostly, mo we're, not gonna, we're not going to tap our glycogen stores at this point. 
As we increase our intensity, we're going to start using muscle glycogen, but we're still going to use fat um, and so forth when you get up to 85%. And I would urge athletes not to be afraid of this. So if muscle gly glycogen is the most being used during VO2 max, it doesn't mean that they're going to lose less body fat. It doesn't mean that they're going to prohibit muscle growth either. Um, it means that they want to make sure they have adequate muscle glycogen stores if they want to maintain the intensity they desire. All right, so different components of energy expenditure. Um, when we look at energy and what we use and how we factor, how we create someone's calorie needs, it's, it could be a precise science, but it's not so easy to figure out. It's not easy to figure out exactly how many calories a person requires. And we'll see the variations in athletes um, in a few slides. So our basal metabolic rate is going to vary from person to person. It's the amount of energy that you need just to be you. So your vital, your vital body functions. It's typically measured first thing in the morning or after eight hours of rest or um, 12 to 18 hours of fasting so that nothing else would be influencing it. Um, we have a thermic effect of exercise. This is the one obviously we can manipulate the most. Um, energy expenditure, it, can, it, can, it will add to total calorie um, requirements substantially or very little if you don't exercise much. And then we have diet-induced thermogenesis. And this one's more of a, um, this is, you know, 5 to 10 percent. It's not highly influential. But, of course, it can, might, it's something that is talked about more in, in, in fad diets because being able to manipulate the amount of calories burned when you're digesting certain foods sounds really awesome. But it's negligible. It's not going to make a huge difference in your overall requirements. All right, and then we have our non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So if you're fidgeting, is anybody in here fidgeting? No? Um, that burns calories. So that's one way that you can try to annoy your neighbor and also burn some calories is fidgeting. All right, so I wanted to include this in here because we're talking about energy. And five-hour energy is extremely, um, extremely popular. It's actually... Um, there are coffee companies that, are, that recognize five-hour energy as their rival, um, as their, with a lot of the, um, in the business community. So in the work setting, in the office space, um, they rec coffee recognizes that five-hour energy is um, moving in on their territory because everybody's looking for a way to have more energy. Um, and so five-hour energy, again, the word energy, you can use it wherever you want. Um, it only contains about four calories per serving. So it's not really going to give you five hours of energy. That's not what it's going to do. Um, at rest, you know, I thought it was kind of funny. You know, if you burn only one calorie per minute, you, it'll still give you about four minutes of energy. So that's, that's good. Um, you know, caffeine is the main driver here. And we are going to talk about caffeine and its relationship to pre-exercise and the impact it may have. Um, but the idea of this giving lasting energy or giving you energy, it's, it's the caffeine. It, and it's not really being metabolized for energy in the body, so it's, it's not really accurate in what it's telling you. And even the vitamins, we know the B vitamins are going to help facilitate energy utilization, but we know that they don't supply us with energy. Um, caffeine, based because it's a central nervous system stimulant, um, it is going to you know, influence the way the body uses fuel for, during exercise, which we'll talk about but it's really this caffeine level in the five hour energy that's giving people the, the feeling that they have lasting energy. So the, it's really important to, to ensure that your athletes aren't choosing that instead of um, something that is going to help to increase their carbohydrate stores or provide them protein or something that's going to provide them real value during an exercise bout. We wanna make sure that they're not choosing five hour energy. And they, you can, you don't blame them for getting confused. It says five hour energy, for goodness sakes. Um, all right, so pre-exercise. What energy types should we be consuming then prior to exercise? Um, we want to find energy, um, foods that contain energy that will help to maximize our ability to exercise and then also push our intensity. So when we look at carbohydrate, um, there's many factors that are going to influence the degree that a carbohydrate will increase your blood sugar. And that's important. It's important for many reasons because we talk a lot about carbohydrates. We talk about blood glucose. We talk about it in a positive way. We talk about it in a negative way. So we consume carbohydrates because we want to increase our blood glucose. And this is 
become a negative conversation if you are concerned, if you are diabetic, if you're not producing insulin. Um, it's a concern if you uh, have other risk factors associated with metabolic syndrome where you might be experiencing insulin insensitivity. So increasing blood glucose sounds like a bad thing. And it sounds like a bad thing if you are worried about a subsequent drop. So if you shoot your blood sugar up too fast and then you, it drops back down and then you feel run down and you don't have energy, so to speak, um, then it becomes a negative. So looking at blood glucose could be perceived as a negative. But when we're talking about active people, people that are doing more than um, gaining weight and not exercising, and, um, especially those that are athletes, increasing blood glucose is something they may be in favor of because in certain, depending on the type of exercise, you're going to want to have an increase in blood glucose. And we all want to have blood glucose anyhow because it's going to feed our brain. It's what keeps us from snapping at our neighbor or you know, someone at work. It's, it's what keeps, you mental, keeps your mental acuity. <laughs> but it's um, certainly gotten Conversation with blood glucose has gotten confusing, especially for the consumer, which is your clients and athletes. All right, so we know that carbohydrate is going to raise blood glucose in different ways based on the chemical bonding between sugar units, the physical accessibility of the carbohydrate to digestive enzymes, um, the speed of stomach emptying, so how long it actually stays in your stomach. Um, looking at insulin or glucose uptake, that's going to affect how it raises the blood glucose, the amount of carbohydrates we consume, as well as the type of sugar that's present. So we'll talk a little bit about those. The glycemic index is, for better or worse, as far as being used as a tool, um, it's just a way to describe how carbohydrate actually affects blood glucose. So it's, the, it's, it's how the magnitude or how the, how the carbohydrate after consumption affects blood glucose. Many things affect that as well, which is why it's a, a difficult tool to use and maybe not one that you're going to actually apply to practice because mixed foods, um, you rarely eat just like one, you know, you're never eating just protein, you know, rarely anyhow. You're always eating, you know, you're eating a mixed meal most often and that's going to affect the glycemic index of a meal. All right, so if it's 100, it means that it increases blood glucose 100%, as though you just took an oral glucose solution. So it's important pre-exercise because we want to maintain blood glucose. We don't want it to drop. We don't want it to continue to rise. We want to maintain it. So if it drops during exercise, it's going to impair performance, whatever your activity is, whether it's strength training or, you're doing, or it's sport or it's high intensity, um, thoughts of high intensity exercise. We need to maintain blood glucose levels. So consuming foods with a more moderate or sustained impact on blood glucose can help to prevent this. So rather than having foods that are going to cause a spike in the blood sugar, um, choosing those that are more moderate. We'll talk about what that means. Um, in general, insulin response to glucose is, is fairly parallel. Um, in insulin, if you have an increase in blood glucose, insulin is going to respond to it. And this may also prohibit fatty acids from being used um, from body fat tissue. So we want to avoid this because um, it leaves less fat to the muscles to, to be oxidized for energy. So if we have a high glycemic and insulin spike pre-exercise, it can make it difficult, in theory, to oxidize fat during exercise. Um, in post-workout, so this is a, this is a good thing. Um, the glycemic response and the insulin spike is actually, it's, it's good for helping to um, produce rapid glycogen resynthesis. Interestingly though, I th the jury is still out on whether or not this high glycemic and insulin spike pre-workout um, would actually affect performance. So it depends on what you measure. So it might not, people tend to get back on the same page. So even if you start out with the, uh, a low blood sugar, or the, with the high glycemic spike with an insulin response, you're kind of like, as you move through time and duration on your, the duration of your activity, you kind of end up with your, your other group as well. So having it affect performance, it, it may not be there, but this is what the theory is with it. So really the goal then is to look at mixing, mixing, having a, a slow as well as a rapidly digested carbohydrate before exercise, Examples of slow would be isomaltulose, 
um, waxy maize starch is something that's being talked about a lot more. I've seen it discussed as a way, as a fast digested carbohydrate, which I was confused by seeing that because really it's a, it represents more of a, it's a slow digested carbohydrate. And all it is, even though it sounds creepy and magical at the same time, it's just barley corn. It's just the starch found in barley and corn. Um, rapidly digested carbohydrates would be your maltodextrin, your glucose, or your simple sugars. Um, so the isomaltulose, it's an isomer of sucrose. It's sucrose is table sugar, and glucose um, and fructose are attached, and this is how we um, create isomaltulose. Um, the, the linkage of it is more difficult to break down, so it makes it it's harder to break apart or hydro, hydrolyze. So in, it can be fully digested in the intestine, so it's a slow digested carbohydrate. It's not a fiber, which sounds like a fiber in essence, right, because those are non-digestible carbohydrates. Um, it's not a dietary fiber, but it just takes longer. It occurs naturally in honey and sugar cane juice. Um, and it can be made from sucrose. And you'll see it in some of the sports products that you might, that you might consume. Um, all right, it, the GI or the glycemic index of it is only 32. So if we look at the blood glucose and the insulin response as compared to, to sucrose, we see that the blood glucose above fasting level, um, about 44 minutes longer for the isomaltulose than the, maltulose than the sucrose. So we see a peak, and then also look at the end, as you see it as the duration increases, you have a, main, a maintenance of that blood glucose level. So not a big spike and not a big drop, but rather kind of a slow and steady. So why is it used along with it? Well, we know that mal maltodextrin is a glucose polymer, and it's going to be a fast, um, a fast acting or a fast digesting carbohydrate and it's very rapidly digested. So we want to combine it in, in food so that we can kind of like, we can manage the increase. We don't have a huge burst, but we have the effects of it, um, and it can be longer lasting. So it can help to, it's tempered by isomaltulose. So less potential for crash or having that subsequent drop. All right, so caffeine. I want to talk just a little bit about that checking time here. Um, using caffeine before exercise, because it's something that's commonly done. Um, it's in some products, sports nutrition products. Um, and so we really want to know um, what, what is it for and how much. So what, what should you be recommending, if anything? <coughs> Not really, I shouldn't say recommending, but what are the comments? What is the information that you would be providing to athletes and your clients? Um, so we know that it's, it has a mild stimulation effect on multiple organs in the body. Um, it's absorbed rapidly from the gastrointestinal tract. The blood um, half-life is about three to six hours. And we find it in foods, um, also in beverages, pharmaceutical sources, and it's naturally found in things like coffee and tea and cocoa. Um, so we'll read through this list together. Not really, I'm just kidding. Um, but these are some of the caffeine sources. Some of the highest ones, as you might expect, are um, venti Starbucks coffee. Those are going to be over 300 milligrams in some of the servings. Um, and then, you know, we even have some in, um, in Excedrin. So like in an aspirin, we'll have some caffeine in it, a lower level. So you can find it all over the place from different colas and whatnot. So why is it ergogenic potentially? Well. It increases, it, it seems to increase fatty acids, free fatty acids, um, and spare glycogen. So this was the first um, reason why it started to be looked at more closely as an ergogenic aid. It's less break, that would lead to less breakdown of glycogen, which is a positive effect because we want to we spare glycogen. It also um, is linked to the excitation of contractions in the muscles. Um, and then it directly stimulates our central nervous system. So the endorphin release causes a, a decrease in our, our perceived exertion. And you know that that's important, and regardless of what it is you're doing. Any workout, you love having a low perceived exertion. At least I do. I don't know. So I feel, that's, my, that's my favorite when I feel like I'm just killing it. Um, and we, it also may stimulate the sodium and potassium pumps, so increase the nutrient entry um, by secondary active transport. 
All right, so what is the ergogenic dose? Caffeine's extremely robust, and what that means is a little goes a long way. Um, it can have the effects on mental alertness and cognition, as well as helping to, um, for increasing the muscle's capacity to do work. Um, the effective dose seems to vary depending on which study that you look at and what your methodology is. So if you're looking at mental acuity, it may be slightly lower than if you're looking at um, the muscle capacity to do work. But enhancing performance, we're looking at about three to six milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And you don't have to be naive to caffeine in order to benefit from it. So you can be someone that consumes caffeine um, regularly and still have a benefit. Um, it's about 210 to 420 milligrams of caffeine for a 154 pound person. Um, doses above six milligrams too high actually can be detrimental. It's not gonna be helpful. You can maybe become too nervous, too jittery. Um, there are some people that can tolerate caffeine at you know, varying levels, however, as we know. Um, doses are much lower, though, when we're looking at mental alert, uh, alertness, and we'll look at a study in just a moment. So the times are improved um, during, uh, in this one particular study, looking at um, swim times with caffeine, showing that the, for a distance, they're capable of swimming in less time, um, 1,500 meters after taking in some caffeine. And they also report that they had um, a lower level of um, perceived exertion. You know, 50 milligrams is enough for mental alertness. So, I mean, I don't think Starbucks is gonna listen to that, but you only need 50 milligrams is beneficial for um, mental alertness. And really it's to, to give you a, a mild stimulant effect. So it's kind of a gentle lift versus a, a high kind of like surge is what you, you wouldn't want to, you're not really looking for a surge as much as you want a gentle lift. Um, it's just enough to get through a workout. So the science, is, there's, a, there's an effect of, a, um, of this dose of about 50 milligrams to help improve this um, with sport. All right, so if we look at some of the, one of the studies that was done with, um, these were individuals that didn't consume more than 400 milligrams of caffeine a day, which is a substantial amount. Um, they were given in doses, dosages that went from 32 to 256. Um, and then they tested a whole bunch of different um, ways to assess mental alertness and mental acuity. So they looked at reaction time, they looked at performance, um, vigilance, they looked at um, you know, fine finger movement, so all of the, these different measures. And what they found is that there's a sweet spot. And so it didn't have to be very high, in order, you didn't have to go all the way to the limit, the highest limits, in order to have a benefit. Um, there was a sweet spot that it was above the 32, but more between the 60 and 250. In general health, you know, there's no consistent evidence to show that there's an issue for cardiovascular function. Um, Certainly, if you have pre-existing arrhythmia that's, or high blood pressure, there's a chance that consumption should be limited. Um, and then maybe interacting with other compounds if you're taking other drugs, that's always important. You know, sleeplessness and jitters are, are linked to caffeine consumption. That's something that absolutely should be considered. Um, and so that might be a reason why people wouldn't use it or if they had any stomach issues associated with it. There's no link known between um, caffeine and cancer, osteoporosis. Um, but the stimulation, the stimulatory effects on, on metabolic rate, they're really minor. So it's not really good, it's not going to be used for weight control. Um, you know, the diuretic effect of caffeine, I think, is interesting. Um, for years, we were worried that you could, saying that you couldn't count um, sources of fluid that contain caffeine when considering your overall um, fluid consumption, and we've now debunked that. Um, there is a mild diuretic effect from caffeine and fluids, so that means that it's going to stimulate urination, but it has not been shown to affect your hydration status. So you, you can count coffee and tea towards your total hydration, and even though it makes you pee a little more, it hasn't been shown to affect your overall hydration. So that's good news, I think, if you like caffeine in there. Um, protein before exercise. So although we talked about it not being the preferred source, um, having protein before exercise can have very positive effects. So we, know, we, know, we don't want to use protein at the expense of carbohydrates because we don't want protein to be used for energy necessarily, but it is um, very useful um, before, to consume protein before exercise. Weightlifting, strength training, 
sport as well as endurance activities. Um, they've shown that protein supplementation can help to decrease muscle damage, also attenuate force decrement, so any decrease in force, um, and, and also enhancing recovery. And um, John Ivey will speak more about um, recovery. So protein timing. So looking at having um, essential amino acids and sucrose um, post-exercise, one and three hours post-resistance uh, exercise. And this amino acid comp composition was based on the availability of essential amino, ac amino acids in proportion to the requirements to actually synthesize muscle proteins. Um, increases in muscle protein synthesis was seen, but there wasn't, and there wasn't any difference in ingestion time. So one hour post or three hours after resistance exercise, we know that there are benefits. But if we look at protein timing as it relates to before exercise, given the same uh, cocktail, so to speak, in a whole protein form, there was actually an increase in amino acid concentration in the muscles at the end of exercise by consuming it prior to the workout. Um, an increase in the amino acid concentration even an hour after, an increase of 86%, and then three hours after post-exercise, still an increase. Um, so consuming, we've traditionally thought of, or you know, looking at, I have to have protein after my strength training workout, but there is evidence to show that the having it before would be, is beneficial. It was even greater in that particular study than it was post-exercise. So pre-exercise ingestion of protein increases the rate of delivery and subsequent uptake by skeletal muscle. Um, and it can also, the pre-exercise protein ingestion can result in 160% um, greater amino acid uptake by skeletal muscle in that three hour post-exercise. Um, and that was, that was more than this, the individuals that were consuming the same supplement immediately after their workout. All right, so if we look at the difference with whey and casein, um, whey ingestion has, a, has been shown to have a rapid appearance of amino acids, it's, meaning it's a higher amount, and it's elevated, but it's transient. And it also promotes protein synthesis. Casein is per absorbed more slowly, so it should not be, we shouldn't look at this as in choosing whey or casein, but rather a blend. And actually, you know, the data to support having whey, casein, and soy is quite powerful. Um, because you have a, a slow and a fast um, protein available. Um, casein is absorbed more slowly, so it's a less dramatic increase in amino acids, but it still um, results in a higher leucine balance, so there are still benefits to consuming both casein and whey. Advantages for protein um, actually can relate to dietary thermogenesis. So when we look at the different macronutrients, even though we define their energy contribution, protein may have an improved thermogenic effect. So not only might it help to increase the amount of calories burned ever so slightly, but it might help you make, help make you feel full longer. So that's satiety. So in, improving satiety as well as decreasing compensatory behavior. So increasing, decreasing the amount of food that you consume after you've had a meal that it contains protein. Um, in this particular study, the, the protein effects on metabolic rate after eating, it was significantly higher than having a, um, a meal that had less, less protein with it. All right, so if we look at the energy requirements for athletes on how to provide them recommendations for actual calorie intake, it's really, really challenging. It's, it's difficult to measure it in each athlete and it's difficult to prescribe it and it's even more challenging, I think, to calculate how many calories you consume a day if you're going to be a free living person that eats meals. All right, five minutes here. Um, so it's, it's difficult um, and also it's going to vary. If you're working with kids, um, you know, growing athletes, that's going to affect their, their calorie um, requirements as well. And then it's especially challenging with those that are trying to lose weight while maintaining the amount of calories they require for their sport. So it's highly vari variable. Um, stages of training is going to be a, an important factor. And there's also variations between sports and within sports. So here's just some data that looks at how many calories are typical among certain um, sports, uh, certain athletes. So rowers, you know, anywhere from 6,500 down to 4,100. 
So that's a, that's quite a that's quite a, um, a variance. So between 46 and 75 calories per kilogram per day. Um, female gymnasts um, are a little bit less variation, but seem to be you know lower below 2,000 for some, and then other studies have shown they consume higher higher amounts. Um, distance runners vary. Um, elite figure skaters, ultra endurance runner, 10,000 calories. That sounds expensive. Um, and a bodybuilder, also expensive at about 8,100 calories a day. Um, and that's about 78 calories per kilogram. So how are we going to calculate it for our athletes if there's such a variation? Um, a quick and easy way to do it is to look at anywhere from 40 to 60 calories per kilogram. For your smaller athletes, the smaller and female athletes, and those that are in a sport that are, are that are where weight becomes an issue, you know, you can adjust that slightly um, and monitor body weight closely. To that's the easiest way to find you. The easiest way to find out if you're eating the right number of calories is to check your body weight. It's a fact. Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, calories, and if you don't have enough calories, you gain weight. No, no, that's not going to happen. You are not going to gain weight if you have insufficient calories, uh-uh, because if I put you in the hospital right now and I didn't feed you for seven days, I know exactly what's going to happen. You're going to lose a lot of weight, okay? So um, we have to look at, you know, the range and then compare it to body weight. And I know that, and then you can consider body fat and also lean body mass as well and doing assessments to kind of see where someone's calorie level should be. Um, other considerations, it's, you know, it, it's only a rough estimate. It's um, monitoring weight is extremely helpful. Um, adjusting it based on their body fat, lean body mass is important as well. And, you know, most people don't know how to report their food intake. And I'm not being critical. Um, it's most people, everyone, dietitians, um, except for personal trainers. I think they know exactly what they're eating, down to the gram. So for those of you in here that may be personal trainers, I know that you know exactly the weight of your lunch. You seem to be a phenomenal group. But most people, including athletes, are, have a tough time reporting what they've eaten. Um, we know that a pound, pound of body fat is about 3,500 calories. So for weight loss, we'd want to be reducing those calories um, throughout a week you know, for a modest weight loss and not too dramatic. Why is that? Because we don't want to lose muscle mass. You are going to lose muscle mass with weight loss, but we don't want it to be, um, especially for athletes, you don't want to lose too much muscle mass as you're trying to lose body fat.